more than grateful. I and we are more than grateful. We are more than grateful. It's not how much we have or how much we've lost. It's how much we've gained. Yes. See? And when you praise God, yes. you gain each and every day. Yes. I don't need to ask you what did God do for you. Because you can give me a whole story. And that's all it'll be. A story. Question is, is it fictional or is it non-fictional? Are you going to speak the truth or are you going to speak a lie to make it look good? You're going to pretend that God did something great for you because you haven't seen it or are you going to speak of the greatness that he has been in your life? Amen? I can honestly do an ending prayer and tell you that God already spoke because he's spoken. This is just like every other Sunday. I'm going to just repeat a lot of things that's already been said. Sometimes I, I say maybe I should just preach before devotion. See, and then you know what happened? Many people walk in and they miss the preaching. They get the devotion and say, oh, pastor's not preaching. See, it's not that. It's that when God speaks, he speaks and he's very clear. Let's open up the Bibles to the God, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. The book of Isaiah, chapter 6. Amen. And I'm going to read verses 1 to 8. Amen. Blessed be your name, my God. Blessed be your name, my God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Amen. The good book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. And it is read in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I'm going to repeat that part. I saw the Lord. High and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Yeah. Woe to me, I cried. Yeah. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among Sorry. a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with the live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for you. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Father God, I come before thy presence, giving you glory and honor. Thanking you for this opportunity that you have given us to be Hallelujah. here. As one body in Christ, my God, to glorify and exalt your name. To give you all the honor and glory for all you've done, all you're doing, and all that you are in point to do. I ask that you manifest yourself in this place like never before. That no one that entered and through these doors depart the same, but full of your joy, your peace. Yes. But most importantly, your love. I ask you this in the precious name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen, amen, amen. You may have a seat, but do not leave the presence of the Lord your God. Amen. Today's theme is very simple. Your encounter. See, your encounter. We read here of Isaiah's encounter. But I'm asking you, 
your encounter. And we can all say, oh, my encounter with God has been fabulous. Well, you sure are not living like it's been fabulous. So I don't know. Like I say, you can give me a story, but where is your glory? See, because when you have an encounter with God, you will be full of glory. People will see your glory, but not know your story. See, if people know your story, it's because you're trying to fill it with glory. You don't have to fill your story with glory because the glory will be all upon you. Amen. Glory be your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. See, somewhere within each of us, there is a deep desire to experience an encounter with God. The problem is that that is all it is. A desire, and that is all that it remains a desire because we get into it, but we do not know how to follow through. Can I get a witness up in here? Amen. Come on, can I get a witness up in here? Because we all have that desire to have that encounter with God, but that's all it remains an encounter. An encounter. A real encounter with God entails more than a desire. It should produce more than just emotions flowing all through within us, wanting to have an encounter. It should result in change. See, a deep desire to have an encounter with God should produce more than your emotions stirring you up to have an encounter. It should produce a change within you. If there is no change being produced, then you are not having an encounter with God. Wow. Well, I spoke to him. I think I heard him. That's the problem. You spoke to him and you think you heard him. When you speak to God and he speaks back, you're going to know that you yes. heard him. Amen. There's the difference. How do you know you heard him? Because you know there was a change within you when you had your encounter. So therefore, the enemy can no longer make you think you heard him, but you will know that you heard him. Where is your encounter? Did you leave it at the altar after you said I do? Did you leave it in church on Sunday after you left out of here? I'll pick it up when I come back. You see, that's a real encounter. See, you cannot encounter God and remain the same for the rest of your life. No one that had an encounter with God Amen. remained the same for the rest of their life. Amen to that. A change came about, and that change produced good fruit. Yes. What is your fruit looking like? If you haven't encountered God yet, then today is your day to stop walking with God and start living with him. See, many people believe that because they walk with God every day, they live in for him. No, you're just simply walking with him, and that's it. Because we get comfortable, and we start to believe, well, I'm walking with God every day. That should be something. That's all it is. It's something. But when you start living with him, then it becomes greater. It becomes something for real because now you know that you know that you know that you are no longer the same person. Amen. That you are not only walking with him, but you are living for him. Praise God. Some people are just comfortable walking with him. Why live for him if I already walk for him? I, I need to live for myself. Watch it. Watch it. You see, many of you here have heard my testimony, and I'm going to share it with you again. Because, see, it was on a Sunday, and, and I was just sitting there, but the pastor was preaching. See, and at the end of his preaching, he made a call, and his words was, falta tu. Falta tu. And I was sitting there, and the spirit began to stir up in me. See, because what he was saying is you're missing. Amen. You're absent. Amen. See, because falta means lack of. It means absence. Amen. And I had a lack of God in me. I had a lack of Christ. See, I wasn't raised in this. 
I wasn't brought up in all of this. I've heard of God, but that was about it. See, I was brought up as a Catholic, a, a, a tradition, a family thing. But I never had an encounter with God. I thought going to church on Sundays was all I had to do. Go to church on Sundays and give my offering, and I was saved. I was okay. Go into the confession booth and tell the priest my confession, and that was it. I was cleaned away. That was it. But see, it came a time when even when I was going to the Catholic school, there was no interest in going to give confession. See, because I was young, but I wasn't dumb. And I always felt going to give confession was a setup. I said, man, I'm going to go in that booth and I'm going to confess to this priest some of the things I've been doing. And he's going to call the police or somebody on me. He's going to call my parents on me. He's going to tell on me. You see? So that remained with me. So was I really giving a confession to him? I was going in the booth and telling him what he wanted to hear. <laughs> and then he was telling me what to do to be able to repent. Giving me my Our Fathers and my Hail Marys. But many of us, many of us here, will go into that confession booth. Were we really confessing our true sins? Or were we holding back? You don't got to tell me. You don't got to tell me, but don't lie neither because God knows it all. See, you can go in the confession booth and you can hold back. Because I did something one time. And they took me to confession every day. Five days a week. Because they just wanted me to confess to the priest what I did. And I said, no way, Jose. No way, Jose. See, so for years... It wasn't helping me. And I'm not saying that, it, that, that everybody does it. I'm giving you my testimony. This was me. And then it came to that point in time where there was no more Sundays going to church. I got to that stage where I didn't go to church no more. The only time I entered into a church, just like many other people out there, when a family's baptism was going on, when Christmas came around, when Easter came, you know, where everybody just wants to dress up all, all fly, nice and pretty, and walk into the church. You understand? I lived there. I've been there. And that was for years. And I'm not knocking the Catholics. Don't get me twisted. I am not. I am speaking of Melvin. I am speaking of who I was when I was growing up back then. That's who I was speaking of. But one day, one day, just that one day, see, I walked into the church out of respect. And from there on out, from that day forward, I continued on my Sundays, on my Sundays. Then it went Sunday to Thursday because God started to do something in me. It was something that I never experienced before. I didn't have people coming to speak to me about God, about the word of God, inviting me to a church or, or trying to get me out of the streets. I had people encouraging me to remain in the streets, encouraging me to do the things that I did, encouraging me and telling me that what I was doing was going to make me rich. Well, none of that made me rich. But I can tell you today, because I remember very clearly, very clearly I remember the day that I walked up to the, to the front and I said, I do. It was around Easter time in April of 1996. It's been a long time. But when I walked up in there, and I said, I do. God did something in me. I didn't look back. See, and the amazing part is that when I stood up, see, when the pastor did that calling, 
and I rose up and I began to walk to the front. The pastor's face, yes. his expression just said it all. Because he looked and he said, you? <laughs> and I was like, mm -hmm. I saw the doubt in his face. But I knew there was no doubt in me. Amen. Amen. See, and when I walked up there, he said, what you up here for? And I told him I couldn't accept Christ. He was like, you sure? I'm like, okay, what's going on? Yeah, <laughs> see, uh -huh. not only did I see the doubt in the pastor, yeah. not only did I hear the doubt in his voice, that didn't intimidate, that didn't discourage me, that didn't make me want to turn back and walk away and not accept Christ. Yeah. See, because that's what the enemy would do. But see, I'm going to give you a little insight. The reason the pastor felt like that was because he knew me. That's right. He knew my past. So when I rose up, he was in shock. Ah. A man that speaks the word of God. Yeah. A man that taught the word of God. Yeah. A man that lived his life for God. Yeah. At one point, he doubted that I truly want to change. <laughs> but that was only because he was my brother-in-law. And he heard some of the stories. And I told you already my testimony on how I ended up going to church. But what was amazing is that, see, even though he had some doubt and he didn't know what was going on at that moment, I knew that I knew that it was time for a change for me. Amen. And I went and I accepted Christ. And that doesn't mean that I became perfect That's right. when I walked out. God started to work on me. Amen. He started to remove things. He started to cleanse me. Yes. He started to peel things yes. away that shouldn't have been. Right. But that was my encounter. Yeah. See, do you remember yours? Santo. Some of you probably don't even remember that exact time and date. All you remember is that one day you got up and you just said, I do. But if I asked you what year it was, you'd be like, wait a minute, was that important? Only if you felt it was important. Amen. See, I didn't write this down this day down in the book. It has just stayed with me. It has stayed with me. It has remained in me. See, and when I go through my troubles, I remember the day that I said I do. Because it was around the time of resurrection. See, and he resurrected and he resurrected something within me. Something that never... I never knew I had in me. Yeah, that's right. But again, it wasn't that it made me perfect that day. Right. It just gave me a desire to want more. Yeah. See, yeah. that deep yeah. desire that we hold within us that makes us want an encounter with God, but yet we leave it behind the minute the troubles arise. Amen. Thank you. But I tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. It has been well worth it. It has been well worth it. And I'm still not perfect now because there are things that God still works in me. But I make sure I remain focused. See, every one of us, and I say every one of us, need to reach that point where our relationship with God is personal and intimate. This isn't about somebody else's relationship with God. See, my relationship with God, my intimacy with God is between me and him. Yeah. Not me, him, and her. Not me, him, and them. No. Amen. See, you got to learn to get into your own relationship with God. <laughs> Have your own encounter, God bless you, with God. Because when you can focus on you and God, Change starts to come. Yes, amen. Things begin to happen. Amen. You begin to look and you're astonished as what's going on here. Yes, See, but you don't doubt. Amen. You don't doubt. Because when you start to doubt, you open the door for the enemy yes. to enter. The enemy to come and stir things up. But there is no room for the enemy when you're getting into a relationship with God. When you
you get into a worldly relationship, you don't want to hear nobody else telling you whether she's good for you or not, whether he's good for you or not. You've already made up your mind. But at the end of the day, what happens? Some of us listen to others. And then what happens? Everything comes crumbling on down because we allow someone to enter into our relationship. And that's what happens with God. We get into a relationship or we start a relationship with him. We have our encounter with him and then we let someone else come and dictate how our relationship with God should be. Your relationship with God is personal. It's personal. Blessed be your name, my God. See, an encounter with Jesus Christ should not just excite us. That's right. See, when we have an encounter with God, it shouldn't just excite us and, and be, oh, yes, you don't know what happened to me. It should bring an everlasting change. Amen. It should be something that no matter where you go, people are going to see a change in you. Not only the excitement. See, we think the excitement brings the change. But the excitement doesn't bring the change. The excitement is just an emotional feeling yeah. that you're going through at the moment. When that excitement wears out, where is your relationship at? Yeah. The excitement died, the relationship died. Shakara. Yes, Lord. Come on, can I get an amen? Can I, can I get a witness? I'm sure we all experience these things. The, the question is, where do you stand? Do you stand firm in the word of God? Or do you just shift along and change for the worse? Wow. Hallelujah. Preacher. Don't let the excitement fool you. Yes. See, how do you know when you've had a divine encounter with God? You'll know you had a divine encounter with God when you see the change in yourself. When you look in the mirror and you no longer see the same old person. When you wake up in the morning and you leave the house and you no longer feel the same way you felt yesterday. Yes, hallelujah. When you wake up in the morning and you give God thanks. Regardless of what you're dealing with. Regardless of what you have to face. Regardless of the situation and circumstances that you stand in. See, a relationship with God is not telling God, if you don't give me this, I'm not going to go to church on Sunday. If I don't get this, wow. then I'm not going to talk to you until I see it. Wow. Wow. We turn a deaf ear and a blind eye on God and think he don't know. We ignore him, but want him to listen to us. I'll give you a few examples of some people before I get into Isaiah. Because we know Moses. Moses. See, and many of us can say he had his encounter with God at the burning bush. And it may sound no good, right? But that was just the start of it. When you start to think about it, he, he had a conversation with God at the burning bush. And that's where he was giving God his excuses of why he couldn't follow through. The burning bush. We all know the story. If you don't, God forgive you. <laughs> but I, I'm not going to say and tell you that was his encounter. Because you see, when you have an encounter, you change. You glow. Now, his encounter was really when he was on Mount Sinai. When he was on that mountain and he was there. See, and he was there a couple of times. But I want to talk to you about the time when he was up there and he said to God, show me your glory. Santo. See, he was there. He had a relationship by then. See, his relationship with God was starting at the burning bush. He didn't, he, he didn't have this great encounter and walked away glowing. 
He walked away stuttering. That's what he did. But I'm going to take y'all to my son. When he was up there on that mountain. And in chapter 33 of the book of Exodus. See, verse 18. It says, Then Moses said to him, Now show me your glory. <laughs> Moses, I don't think he stuttered. When he was up there and he was speaking with God, I don't think he stuttered. I think he was straight up. He said, now show me your glory. That was verse 18 from the book of Exodus chapter 33. But let's look at what, what verse 19 says. It says, and the Lord said, I will because all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And verse 20 says, But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. But Moses was bold enough to tell him, Now show me your glory. And then if you keep reading, It'll keep going, and it'll move on, and it'll tell you. Then the Lord said, there is a place near where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Verse 29 of chapter 34. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets on the, of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. Santo. See, when you speak with the That's Lord, right. something yeah. is going to change Hallelujah. on you. Something is going to change on you. See, not only did Moses have an internal change, now he had an external change. Yes. His Come face on. was radiant. Yes. His face was so radiant that the people became scared. Keep reading the story. It's written there. But that was powerful. Yes. Because you see, it said after that, he put a veil over his face. See? But because he put the veil over his face, it doesn't mean that the radiant left. It doesn't mean that the glow left. It was just that it was too much for the people. Because it says that whenever he went to speak to God, he removed it. Because he wanted that glow before the before yes, God. God. See, he didn't ask God to show him the glory for nothing. He didn't ask God to show him the glory so that he could just be excited and brag about it. He asked God, now show me your glory because he wanted a change. He wanted something different. He didn't want the same old thing that he had. And he lived with that glow. Yes. He lived with that glow. He wasn't perfect, but he accepted that glow. He took in that change, you see, and he brought it forth. Yes. And we can say, well, his first encounter was when he was at the burning bush. That was a conversation. That was the start of something. Just like when you walk into the church. When I first walked into church, it wasn't a change, an immediate change. It was the start of something. Amen. But because I had that deep desire as I moved forward and continued to go to church, then, then the Holy Spirit began to work in me. And that calling that day when the pastor said you are lacking something. You are absent. Find that food. Yes. That spirit stirred me up. Yes. 
And I said, yes, indeed, that is me. Praise God. Hallelujah. And I accepted it. Yes. And I left out of there in victory. Yes, and I remain in that victory. Amen. It's not easy. I know it's not easy. But it is worth it. Amen. It is worth it. Amen. Yeah, there's times that I might have sat there and said, God, what did I do? I was better off when I was over here. Mm -hmm. But God reminds me that that is a lie from the That's devil. Right, sure is. See, God reminds me yeah. that that is a lie from the devil. Amen. Then I go back to remember that that is a lie from the devil. Because nothing that I did then had helped me out. But everything that I do now is to glorify God's name. Amen. And that's why I can stand firm Thank when I speak Lord. of him. You, Not because I'm perfect, that's right. but because I'm a witness mm -hmm. of what God has done. Yes. Thank you, Glory be your name, my God. I'm going to give you Peter, James, and John. The three favorite ones that always moved along with Jesus. They didn't have their encounter when they first followed Jesus. That was the start. Amen. We've spoken about this. They started to follow Jesus, but then they went back to their occupation. Mm -hmm. They went back to the boats. Mm -hmm. Then they came and they followed Jesus again. See, but their real encounter, their real encounter came the day of the transfiguration. Yes. The day of the transfiguration was when they had their real encounter. Why do you say that, Pastor? See, I like that. I like that you ask questions. I like the motivation within y'all. You want to know why? Because when you think about it, and you go back, and you read, and, and if you miss it in one, you'll find it in another. Because you'll find it in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. For second of Peter, yes. chapter one. I'm going to I'm going to go to second of Peter, chapter one, because Peter spoke of that because he witnessed it, he lived it. Sure it wasn't a story. Thank you, Lord. But when you read it, you'll see. And see, why do I say that? Is because you see, when they were there, and Jesus was talking to the Father. And the transfiguration came. They saw the radiant of, on Jesus' face. Amen. The radiant. Yes, Lord. They saw that glow. Yeah. They saw something different. And because they saw that, and not only because they saw that, but because they heard the voice of God. Because God himself said, that is my begotten son. They heard it directly. From the father's mouth. Why? Because they were there with Jesus. When you walk with Jesus. You will hear the voice of the father. Amen. Problem is that we want to hear the voice of the father. Without walking with Jesus. Or we walk with Jesus. And we think that's good enough. The father has to speak to us. The transfiguration of Jesus was an event reported in the New Testament when Jesus is transfigured and becomes radiant in glory upon a mountain. That's what the transfiguration speaks about. That's the event that took place there. That is the event that changed Peter, James, and John. The glory that they saw. See, that glory they saw fall upon Jesus. They saw Jesus in a different way on that day. But that change that they saw upon Jesus brought a change upon them. That's why I say, when you have an encounter with God, when you have an encounter with Jesus Christ, you can no longer be the same. If your life is still the same and you dare say that you had an encounter with Christ, you better go back and check yourself. Wow. You need to check yourself. Analyze 
Where did it go wrong? Where did you leave the encounter? Because you surely ain't walking in an encounter. Second of Peter. Second of Peter, chapter one. Let's listen to what verses 16 and 18 say. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Too many of us go up on the mountain and we become comfortable. That's all it is. We go up on the mountain to look down. When you go up on the mountain, it should be get to get closer with God. Not to look down below to see who stayed and who didn't stay. To see who's still around and who's not around. That is not your problem. That has nothing to do with you. You cannot save anyone. You can only pray for someone. Wow, so when you're up on that mountain, it is your time to speak with God. God, here I am. Show me your glory, God. Show me your glory. I want my face to be radiant. I, I want to leave this mountain shining. I want to leave this mountain glowing. I want to be like Moses was. Do it again, God. Bring me down off this mountain. But when my family sees me, they see something different in me. When I go to work, people will see something different in me. When I go to school, they will see something different in me. When I walk the streets, people will see something different in me. If people continue to see the same old thing in you, don't you dare say you had an encounter with God. Because all you're going to do is not only lie to them, you lie to yourself. And that's why people don't want to come to church. That's why they say, why go to church if you're still the same? You just speak different. Talk is cheap. Everybody can talk it, but not everybody can walk it. Amen? Come on, let's be witnesses up in here today. Let's give God glory. I can testify. I've been there. God didn't make a change in me overnight. It took time. But it wasn't that much time. See, it wasn't that much time. See, I walked into the church in June of 1995. In April of 1996, I accepted him as my Lord and Savior. In January of 1997, I became baptized. It wasn't easy, but I took those steps. I didn't wait a year to say, well, maybe this is the year God is going to do this. I didn't wait another year to say, maybe God is going to do this. No, it was at God's time and moment. As he stirred my spirit, I jumped into the waters. I didn't have to wait for someone to push me. This wasn't forced on me. It was just spoken upon me. And because it was spoken to me, I was able to take it in. I didn't go to research to see what this was. I jumped in and said, if there's a God, he's going to change me. And as he brought the change in me, I got closer and closer to him. Remember, this is just my testimony. This is just me. God does it different with everybody. See, because now I'm going to bring you Paul, who used to be Saul. You can go to the book of Acts chapter 9, and y'all read the story on your own. Jesus, have your way. Have your way. Have but see, your way. you have to know Thank who you. in the Bible 
motivates you. What book in the Bible can bring a change in you? Because I've always told everybody, the book of Acts changed my life. Changed my way of seeing things. Changed my way of believing. Because I said, if God did that for that man, oh man, I'm nothing compared to that. He can truly change my life. And I move forward. Yeah, when I first started going to church, I had a big, huge Bible. Because sure, too, you're sitting right in that back room. Pages fly all over every time I open it. There you go. The word is still in there. The pages can fly. But the words remain. I was scared. I was like, man, pastor didn't have to give me this. This is like a suitcase. <laughs> and I used to be in the train. I used to look around and see if I saw somebody I knew before I opened it. But God, but God brought a change upon me. And one day, walked into that train, and anybody that lived in New York City or traveled through New York City on rush hour, you see, you in there, and there's no space for nothing. But whenever I got on that train, me and my Bible, we made space. <laughs> because I started to open it. Amen. I don't know if people just moved away because the word was open on the subway. <laughs> Well, God just opened the way. That's right. Amen. But from that day on, the minute I did it the first time, the shame, the fear disappeared. Yes. That's how you know when God is changing. Yes. You no longer worry about how people look at you. Yes. See, you no longer worry. That's right. See, it's not the size of the Bible. Mm. It's the intake of the words. That's right. See, people carry small Bibles and say, well, nobody's going to know this is a Bible. They're going to think this is my diary. <laughs> Stop lying to yourself. Stop worrying about what other people worry or how they look at you. Your encounter with Christ is your encounter. That is what's going to bring a change. Not your encounter with someone else. Not holding on to somebody else and say, well... God did it for them. They're going to do it for me if they just keep praying for me. No, you need to learn to start praying for yourself. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Lord. you want to change, start being a difference. So, his journey to Damascus was the last journey to persecute Christians for the remaining time of his life. See, that one came suddenly. That's right. See, that one came suddenly. So Jess, God can do a sudden change in you. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. Only if you want it. That's right. Thank you. Because that day, see that day, if you read the story, here was Saul heading on out. See, with letters and all, to do whatever he felt like doing to these Christians. He had the worldly king seal, signet, and everything else you wanted to think about or call it. But there he was on his journey. Till all of a sudden, he was struck down to the ground. Boom! Sometimes that's all God needs for you to hit the ground so that you can realize. He don't want you to bump your head on the ground and catch your knees or something, he wants you to hit your knees on the ground and call out and say, Lord, why are you doing this? So that he can tell you why. That's all it is. But that day, Saul fell to the ground and said, Lord, Lord, why are you doing this to me? Lord, who are you? Lord, why me? Why not you? You're the very same one persecuting all my people. The people with him became scared. They didn't hear the voice, <laughs> but they surely knew something was going on. They never, ever, ever seen Saul in that manner. But that's what it took to bring a change in him. That's what it took. What is it going to take to bring a change in you? 
What? We always say, tomorrow is not promise. Don't come say, well, God, tomorrow's going to be my day because today I got to finalize a couple of things. You better finalize them before you leave out of here. Because today is your day. But they were sore. God had to blind them for three days. But from that day forth, from that day forth, Saul's life changed. So did his name. Yes, that's right. Because it changed to Paul. That's right. The disciples didn't trust him. Mm -hmm. Nobody trusted him. Because all they thought about of who he was. Santo. But when God brings a change Thank upon you, your life, Hallelujah. you are no longer who you were. That's right. Your past should no longer be in your present. That's right. And it should definitely not travel into your future. Hallelujah. It shouldn't. Paul's time was counted. Well, Saul's time was limited because Paul's time became eternal. Mm -hmm. That change upon him was a change. He repented. He asked God for forgiveness, and he was forgiven. Even when the people said, wasn't he the one persecuting? That changed because they came to realize that he no longer was the same person. See, when he went down onto the ground, the light came upon him. He rose up a different person. He rose up being cleansed of who he was because he was blinded for the three days. But it doesn't mean that he remained the same until he opened his eyes because the moment that light shined upon him, everything that he was, was cleaned away. It was removed. So he no longer rose up the same. Jesus. Don't think that God is tired of hearing. Well, it's a process. It's a process. Cheese is processed. Wow. And it doesn't stay the same. Wow. Well, Amen. Glory. Santo. <laughs> wow. You don't go to the same piece of cheese years later and it says, still being processed. <laughs> <laughs> One of these days I'm going to become cheese lips. No. No. It's a lie from the devil. We serve a good God. Glory, glory. Glory, glory. Now, I'm going to finish up, but we can't stop. Because see, we have to take a look at the verses read. See, we have to see Isaiah's story here. See, my story is my story. But see, it, it, it's been a long journey, and you'll only get bits and pieces of it from time in to time out. See, I don't have to tell you who I used to be, what I used to do. All you have to know is that I was a, 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 a disobedient little boy, but I became a matured Christian. Amen. A matured Christian. See, I never turned back once I said I do. I wasn't perfect, and God worked through me and in me. But I can tell you now, even during my toughest times, I never ever looked back and said, I'm going back to do this. I didn't. Temptation comes, but it comes to everybody. But you knock that, you, you knock it silly. You have the power and authority to simply not get silly. Back up. Get away. When family comes up against you, you can laugh. You can laugh. Everybody knows that saying. Oh, stick and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But yet you let the words hurt you. We say it, but we don't mean it. We just say it because everybody else says it. Or we try to be strong, and then when, when the minute everybody walk away, we want to break down. You don't need to break down. That's right. You need to rejoice Glory. and give God thanks Hallelujah. and glorify his yes. name. Because all that pain that was brought upon you will disappear yes. when you shout out and glorify your God. Yes. 
See, God tells us something, it goes into here and it comes out to here. People tell us stuff, it goes into here and it comes out to here. We got it twisted. We got to reverse it. When the people tell you something, let it go into here and come out to here. And when God tells you something, let it go into here and sink into here. Because he starts to clean your heart. Amen. People ain't cleaning your heart. Woo! They're not going to purify your heart for you. Santo. They're going to poison your heart. Amen. Let, let us look at the verses. Let us see how Isaiah was affected by his encounter. See, because we read it. But, but what I love is in the very first verse, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. He didn't say, I heard the Lord. I think it was the Lord. He was sure. He said, I saw the Lord. That's powerful. Because see, the Bible before said that if anybody saw him, they would die. But here was Isaiah. He said, I saw the Lord. That means a whole lot. Thank you, Lord. That means a lot. Can you imagine what he must have felt at that moment? Imagine you being facing face to face with God, with the Lord right there. Some of us are going to shock. Some of us will drop to our knees real quick. Oh God, forgive me, 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 forgive me. Forgive me. Because we know we are so far away. See, we try to take advantage and use grace as an excuse for us to continue to do what we do. But that doesn't work that way. See, you got to realize, when he said, I saw the Lord, he wasn't dreaming. He wasn't having a vision. It was not a nightmare for him. He was not making up a story. He was not letting his imagination run wild. It was a real encounter with God. That's why he said, I saw the Lord. Mm. How many of you can say y'all saw the Lord? Amen. 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 See, Isaiah's experience was a true life-changing encounter with the Lord of glory. It was with the Lord of glory. I just got to get to to see. Even the cherubim, when you look at this, it says this describes the cherubim because he goes in describing what, what, he, what he witnessed, what he saw there. You know, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe yes. filled the temple. Yes. The train of his robe yes. filled the temple. Yes, God. See, God's glory should fill your yes. temple. Hallelujah. Because you are the temple. Yes, so his God. glory should be all in you. Yes. And it should fill your temple. But I, I, I just love when he said, Above him was seraphims, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. Yes, and with God. two they were flying. Yes, so even Lord. the cherubims covered their face. Hallelujah. Covered their But yet, but yet, yes, God. God allowed Isaiah to see him. Come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Isaiah himself said, I saw the Lord. Lord have mercy. Verse 4. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. When you call out to God, is it like an earthquake for you? Do you feel the, the ground shaking? Does your room fill up with smoke? Do you see and feel the glory? Because Isaiah, Isaiah says, when they spoke, the doorpost shook. 
and the threshold was shaken up. Hallelujah. When God speaks, he speaks. Something has to shake. You need to shake. You need to shake. And this happened while he was there. He was there in the presence of the Lord. In the presence. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And if I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. He himself didn't feel worthy. Woe to me. Woe. I'm going to die here now. Because I've seen the face of God. I've seen his glory. I'm going to die. I live among unclean people. My lips are unclean. My words are unclean half the time. Can I get a witness? Because many of us is like that. Our mouth is unclean. We speak uncleanliness. But here was Isaiah. Going into a panic. He said, my life is over. That's it. I am ruined. I am ruined. I'm going to die today. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. But then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned. When God's hands is laid upon you, your sin is taken away. You no longer have to feel that guilt. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. See, when you come and you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, your sins are forgiven. You don't have to live with the guilt of what you used to do or who you used to be. That's right. God changes you. He gives you that opportunity to stand firm and continue to move forth. Isaiah, a prophet, when he has his encounter there, he was feeling guilt. Thank you, Lord. But the Lord reminded him, brought the live coal, and placed it on his lips, right on his mouth. Letting him know that's been taken care of. Stop thinking that you're unclean. Stop thinking that your sins are going to live with you forever. They have been atoned. You are a new person. You have been cleansed. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Are you one of those valiants? Are you one of those that when the Lord says, Whom shall I send? That you could truly stand up and say, Here am I, Lord. Send me. I'm ready, God. I'm ready. Everybody's ready to receive a title, but not everybody's ready to do the will of God. There's a difference. See, Isaiah didn't say, give me a title and I'll go do your work, God. When God said, whom shall I send? Whom shall go for us? Isaiah raised his hand and said, here I am. Here I am. Standing right here. Right in your presence. Send me, God. I'm ready. I'm ready. I can witness. I've been witnessing. But I can witness more because now I have seen you. I spoke 
of your greatness. But I have been in your presence. I have seen your glory. I have been face to face with you. Send me. Send me. Amen. Today's your day. Take what God has given you. Y'all have heard it from the very beginning. God's glory. And all. Let us not continue to be pretenders. Let us not continue to be pretenders. What do you mean, Pastor? I'm going to tell you what I mean. Because you see, we have those who have had a true encounter with God, and we have those who pretend to have an encounter with God. How do you know, Pastor, that they pretend to? I'm glad you asked. Because you see, after they stood up, after they moved forward, after they prayed, wept, and cried, after they shed tears, after it appeared to be to be slain in the spirit. Yeah, after they appeared to be slain in the spirit, they get up and they carry on living the same way that they did before. There is no change. They go back to the same old street. They forget to hit Change Boulevard. That's how you know they're pretenders. Pretenders don't continue to live the same way. True believers change. True believers hit the Change Boulevard. True believers do God's will. They don't continue to act the same way they did before. When you have an encounter with God, your life is to change. Your life supposed to change. For the better, not for the worse. Rise up to your feet. See, that's how I know what a true believer says. When a true believer says, I had an encounter with God. Their life speaks for itself. Their actions speak louder than the words. Because many can speak it, but not many will live it. I believe when you have a true encounter with God, it changes you. And as I told you earlier, I am a witness and I am a living testimony of it. Are you a witness? Are you a witness? Is your life a testimony of what God has done to you for you in your life? I just everybody just close your eyes right there for one for one moment. God, you're so precious. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And with your eyes closed, just ask yourself, where do you fit? Where do you stand? Have you had your encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you see a change in yourself? Just meditate. Just keep your eyes closed. And I'm going to do a calling, but everybody just keep your eyes closed. Hallelujah. Because this isn't about who, 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 who's doing what. This is about you and God. This is your moment just to give to him. Just to ask him. What is it that you need to do to really change? What is it that you need to do to really see him?
why are you there? And I say communion, why are you there? Just having that moment where if you feel that you need to accept him as your Lord and Savior. Because when you did before, it was just pretending. It was just to give show. Then this is your opportunity to step forth. Regardless of what people feel or how people are going to look at you. If you accept him, but yet you just backslid a little. You hit the mud pile and slid down. This is your time to come up and just say, Lord, I need to be cleansed. I need, I want that encounter with you, God. I want a life-changing encounter. This is your opportunity. Like I say, we don't do this to force no one. Because you got to want it. So I'm just going to pray. Amen? Amen. Father God, I come before thy presence giving you glory and honor. Thanking you for this moment that you have given us, Heavenly Father, to find ourselves, to glorify your name. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you've done, all that you're doing, but most importantly, what you are on point to do, Heavenly Father. You know all things, Heavenly Father. You know all things. I ask that you remove the fear or whatever it is, the shame, or whatever, Heavenly Father, that truly impedes us from coming closer and closer to you. That's good with a distraction, God. Remove it in the name of Jesus, Heavenly Father. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. That double mind is the spirit, God, that's upon some of their minds right now, God. That spirit that has them, Almighty God, in captivity for years now, God. Father, you know exactly yes, who they Father, are, Almighty you know God. Things. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, right now, Father, Father God, those, those, um, those that are being influenced upon, by Satan, that they hear, they hear those voices more than your voice. Yes, my God. Yes, my God. Call it out like a rabosoka, like a mandilla sokaya. Oh, my God. Those minions that have been surrounding their homes and their lives for years now, God. Break it through, Heavenly Father. That they don't know how to even break, break free from me. God, that spirit of error right now in the name of Jesus. Yes, my God. That governs their heart and their mind. In the name of Jesus, Father God. Jesus. We bind in the name of Jesus, Father. We listen to your heart right now, God. We tap into your heart. Father God, for there are so many people that have been stagnant in your ways and who you are. Father, we come against that in the name of Jesus. That spirit of heaviness and oppression, Almighty God, that's in your people's shoulders, oh Lord Jesus. Right now, in the name of Jesus, those that yes. want to be free, Almighty God, will be free and shall be free by the blood and the power in Jesus' name. Yes. with your blood and you have given you have um, instructed us almighty God like Ephesians 6 to put on our armor and if we don't put on our armor it is not 